So when Susan had this recurrence of depression, her tendency was to go back into automatic pilot and to respond to her depression the way that she had every other time that she had depression, which was to um, follow the directions of the depression, if you will. The depression has these instructions that say, you're not interested in these things. Stop doing them. Don't engage with other people. You're not interested. You could sleep all the time. Nothing. Everything looks gray. So maybe just hang out in your room or in your bed and ruminate and worry, but don't engage in life. And with MBCT and the practices that she had learned and working together, she was able to meet that episode of depression quite differently than she had in the past because she was able to see that pattern that was being pulled for, that because she didn't have interest or motivation, because she was just in a state of restlessness and worry, um, that it was going to likely proceed as it had in the past, which was to get worse because the depression was pulling for things that would take her away from and out of anything that could potentially give her joy. So the way we worked with that with mindfulness-based therapy is you bring the capacity of attention, like I said, to meet that experience. So with her mindfulness practice and with the attention, she was able to see that this was happening, not dismiss the fact that it was happening, that she didn't feel any interest or motivation, that her mood was very low, um, that she was having really negative thoughts about herself. But with mindfulness, she was able to see that um, she didn't have to run the old script. She didn't have to respond to depression in that same way. So we work to be able to um, use this principle of mindfulness to see her thoughts, particularly her thoughts about herself, as real, but not necessarily true, as thoughts that she was having, not descriptions of reality. So in the past, she would just say, well, I'm a failure, as if that were absolute truth. With mindfulness, um, she could see that she was having the thought that she was a failure. And now cognitive therapy would have us really go after and address the content of that thought. Well, Susan, what is the evidence that you're a failure? You're a successful physician. You um, have excellent reviews at work. You have a fulfilling marriage. You have good relationships with your kids. All of these things that would address why that isn't true. And how else might you think about yourself? What are some other more um, accurate thoughts? That's what cognitive therapy would do. It would go after the content of the thinking. In mindfulness-based approaches, the content of the thinking is really not where we spend any time. It's about changing the relationship that she has with that thought that she's a failure. So that, again, she can recognize that it's there but not treat it as truth. And so one of the examples that we do in MBCT class is I read a story to people and I have them track the thinking that goes along with that story. And so they watch their thoughts with the story. It's a very short story. It goes something like this. And I would encourage you to watch your own thoughts around what thoughts you're generating internally as I say this story. Here it is. Johnny was on his way to school. He was very worried about the math class. He was not sure he could control the class again today. It was not part of the janitor's duty. the end. So it's a very, very simple story. And then I have people track their thoughts. What did you think? Almost everybody says, oh, I thought Johnny was a student. I was pretty convinced Johnny was a student. 
Um, a lot of people say, oh, it brought me back to fourth grade math and that was terrible for me. They're already having an experience of like either I loved math class or why would you be worried about math class or oh, math. Yes, that gives me such anxiety. I already feel anxiety because I hated math class. Um, and then they say like, oh, but I was wrong. Johnny must be the teacher. He was worried about the math class. He wasn't sure he could control it again today. And they see that their thinking said, oh, Johnny's a teacher. And then at the end, they're like, what? He's the janitor? I would have bet money that he was a student. And then I would have bet more money that he was a teacher. And nobody would have bet money that he was a janitor. And so this is happening all the time for us. We have this thought generation thing called our mind that's always kicking up these thoughts. and. Without mindfulness, we just believe that they're true. They're real, and we just invest a lot of veracity into what we're thinking instead of seeing that our mind is just doing what our minds do, which is generating a lot of thoughts, some of which are true, some of which are even helpful. But by definition, all of our thoughts are not true. And when we have to dive into the content of them, um, we're still giving them a lot of power. So that's an exercise that we can do with any number of stories where you have people really see that everything they're thinking may not be true. So in some ways, not trying to parse what's true and what's not true, but just see that that's a thought. That's a thought. So she's having the thought that she's a failure. In this case, going back to Susan, she's having a thought that she's a failure. But when you change the relationship with that thought, she doesn't have to do the kinds of things that one might do if they were a failure. She can make a value aligned um, and a very intentional mindfulness choice about how best to support herself because she's feeling so bad. Not necessarily to change how she's feeling. That's also not part of the proposition. But because she's feeling so bad, what might feel better to her? What might be an intentional choice? So in Susan's case, movement was a really um, effective source of pleasure, of contentment, of joy, of competence and confidence for her. So part of that um, MBCT-based intervention is to say like, um, well, movement like yoga or cycling you don't feel like doing it. She's depressed. She doesn't feel like doing it. Her thoughts will tell her, like, she's no good at it anyway. Why bother? And instead of trying to go after the content of the thought or dismantle that, to just bring that little bit of awareness so that she has that power to choose. And in that moment, say, well, I'm going to choose to do this. And so to do the things, whether it's movement, or social engagement, or just showing up to work, um, not to change her experience and not to get into any kind of debate about her thinking, but just to see her thoughts as thoughts, not necessarily true. Um, and often when somebody is really anxious or really depressed, the thoughts are also not very kind. They're not really imbued with self-compassion. But again, instead of trying to address the content of them, of bringing that awareness to say, I don't have to run the same script. I don't have to do what my, the kinds of behaviors that my thoughts would have me do. So that's one of the ways in which um, working with recurrent depression. And so how do you support yourself because you're depressed, not necessarily to do anything other than to support yourself because you're depressed? 